In this podcast, we have conversations about personal experiences with loss, grief, and unexplained spiritual encounters. Whether it's a dream, a visit, a vision, or a newfound life after loss, we believe life and love never dies. This is Surviving Death and Dying with Trisha and Misty. Today, we are honored to have the presence of a nationally known author, presenter, and grief expert with over 50 years experience. She co-founded the Centering Corporation, America's oldest and largest bereavement resource center, and Ted E. Bear Hollow, which is a center for grieving children, along with her late husband, Dr. Marv Johnson. These are both nonprofits in Omaha, Nebraska. She has also written or edited more than 100 books and articles about grief. And her latest endeavor is a novel called The Burned Out Old Broads at Table 12, which has taken her to hundreds of presentations for seasoned women. Welcome, Mrs. Joy Johnson Brown. We're so glad to have you. Yes, welcome. Thank you, Misty and Trisha. I'm so pleased to be with you. And I was excited when you said, let's talk about grief. And I said, let's talk about the evolution of grief because over 50 years, I have seen big changes. Joy, Misty tells me that you entered her life like the pilot episode of Friends. For anyone who hasn't seen the show, Ross says, I just want to be married again. And Rachel enters the coffee house Central Perk in her wedding dress. So as I remember it, Misty said something like, I wish I knew somebody who could help me with my son's grief after losing his great grandmother. Suddenly, You and Marv walked into the coffee house saying, hi, we're grief counselors who specialize in children's grief. I'm curious to hear your side of the story, Joy. Yeah, that's what we do. We we walked into coffee houses, met people at random and said, hi, you know, we're grief counselors. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But that was really, that was really pretty close. I mean, the time, yes. which is one of the interesting things that tell us there's something more than just here. Right, exactly. That time like this happens so often with just the right people at the right time. And uh, one of the interesting things about life after life that I have read about is that we are thought to have soul clusters where we are our souls together and you recognize the people who are alive on earth from your soul cluster when you meet them. And that was kind of like us. We just knew each other. We didn't have to get acquainted whether our auras all matched or what, but we, we knew each other right away. That's amazing. That's great. I love that. That'll have to be another podcast. We'll talk about soul clusters. I love that you said that, Joy. That was in 2008. My grandmother had passed away and I was stressing over my son having a hard time dealing with grief. And she literally said, well, hi, we're grief counselors, (laughs) especially (laughs) in children. We we were in a coffee house. (laughs) And we went there more than once. And then we, we hit Panera's a lot after that. After church. <laughs> so most of your life has been built around grief. What made you choose grief counseling as a career? It, it was a totally timeless, like the clock that is chiming <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, well, y'all, it came with the right time. Um, my late husband and I, were both involved in the church. He was a chaplain. I worked for a district in the Methodist church and we got tired of committees. So we both broke away and we started Centering Corporation, which he named because when you're centered, you can be pushed either way and you don't fall over. So this was was centering. And we began with communicating with hospitalized children and their families. And then a nurse said, we really need a book for parents whose child dies. And I said, oh man, that's a tough one. But we wrote a little book called Children Die Too for the early griever. Children Die Too, and it's still in print. 
and that was in 1977. So after 43 years, the book is still the basic little book on grief for parents whose child dies. And then the same nurse who was a troublemaker from the word go said, we really need a book for parents whose child is critically ill and dying. And so we wrote a book called Why Mine? And that one is still in print. And then a funeral director said, there's no funeral book for children. So we wrote a funeral book for children called Tell Me Papa. And that moved us into grief full time. So it was just a step by step by step. And uh, at, in 1977, at that time, all kinds of different things began to happen. Hospice came to America in 1977. The Compassionate Friends, a group for parents of children who have died, started in America. So we were there when a whole lot of things went off the ground. It sounds like you were really the pioneer on being able to talk about grief and opening up to children. Yeah. And We were. And there yeah. were so few of us. Earl Grohlman, who is grandfather grief and has written 37 bestsellers on grief, was a real pioneer with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And Earl said, if we could have, we could have had a convention if we could have found a phone booth large enough. <laughs> At that time, there were seven books on grief. Wow. wow. Now, Janet, my daughter, who has Centering Corporation, can get her hands on over a thousand. Yeah. Well, and we can put links to these books that you just mentioned in our show notes as well. So people can get them. And you know, when Trisha and I contacted you, cause we knew we're like, we've got to get Joy Johnson on this yes. podcast. You had the best idea. And it makes a lot of sense to talk about the evolution of grief during your 50 years of experience. We thought what a great idea. That's fabulous. And we imagine it has changed a lot since you started. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So where does this start in your 50 years? For, for my 50 years, it really started in 1969 with a little Swiss psychiatrist named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was here since Noah left with the art, but she never lost her accent. She always talked like this. Just a little lady with minimum maintenance hair. And she was at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, big hospital. And a bunch of chaplaincy students came to her and said, our assignment is to write about life's greatest crisis and we think life's greatest crisis is dying. And Ross thought about this and she agreed. So her first job was she went around to different wards, different units in the hospital asking if they had any dying patients. And to her total surprise, no one ever died at Cook County. Oh. No one would admit <laughs> anybody died on their unit. So she began walking around in her white coat stethoscope, doctor's name, and going into rooms to seeing how sick people looked. And when she found someone who really looked sick, she would go up and say to them, I want to know what it's like to be so sick. She wouldn't say the word dying. I want to know what it's like to be so sick. And the first thing she learned was listen to the dying. And she found a man who was really ill. And she said, I have this group of students. And we want to know what it's like to be so sick. And he said, sit down now. She said, oh, no. I, I will come back tomorrow and I want to bring the students. He said, no, sit down now. And she left saying, I will be back first thing in the morning. And he died shortly after she left. Just oh, wow. Listen oh to gosh. the dying. Listen. Yes. To the dying. So wow. she did some really heavy duty research. She was called the vulture. They didn't allow her on some units because we were so much in denial and of death and afraid of death. And so she eventually came out with what were known as the five stages of dying. And they were the stages of dying. And later they got transposed in stages of grief. They're not bad stages. Now we're looking at them and saying, those weren't all crazy. But she said there is denial, 
mm-hmm. bargaining, yeah. Yeah. anger, depression, yeah. and acceptance. Yeah. And those are all involved in dying, in grief, and interestingly enough, in forgiveness. When you have someone that you are determined to forgive, you will find that you went back and you said, oh, it's not, it's no big thing. It's no big deal. And then you said, oh, well, if I, you know, if I really, if I live my life differently, this won't bother me anyway. Then you just get mad as hell. And then you get depressed about it. And then finally end up saying forgiveness better for me than them. I'm going to do it for me. And that doesn't mean you forget, but those five emotions, they're really five emotions, even denial is an emotion, work with so many things. And as one mom said, thank God for denial. Otherwise a parent's heart would break. So she was really groundbreaking. I mean, this was the decade that I was born at the end of that decade, just to put things into perspective, Trisha and I want to relate our ages with what you talk about. So it's, it's interesting that that was just beginning to be a conversation and not even accepted yet at the end of the sixties. Exactly. And then you were really instrumental. You were saying in the seventies with your books, you were coming out with, were the first of its kind. And that was the decade Trisha was born, right? Yes. Yeah. In the seventies, it began to advance more Trisha. And there were two distinguished and they were eloquently distinguished. You know, I met them when they had, you know, the white hair and they, and the suits called Balby and Parks were their last name from Britain, complete with accent. And they put, they put it into, into verbs, not only nouns like anger or denial, but also they added verbs to it. So that their first thing that happened was shock and numbness, which are nouns, but shock and numbness. And I think sometimes, I don't think, I know sometimes, example, yesterday I had lunch with a really good friend of mine. Her cousin, her 86-year-old cousin, two of his sons and a daughter-in-law were swept into a river in Colorado. They were in a cabin, his cabin, where he went every summer for four months. They had a mud, there was a mudslide behind the cabin and picked up the cabin and swept it into a river. Oh my gosh. They have found the daughter-in-law's body, but no one else. Well, you cannot get your mind around that. It is shock and numbness. Exactly. And it is just, and, and Ruth said, you know, I can't, I still cannot believe it. So the shock and the numbness comes that you, you just are there in space for a while. And after that, he said, we move into searching and yearning. And I love those two words, searching and yearning. A parent will see a child, particularly a grown child, walking down and the street and be sure it is their child. And just for that split second, you see that, the searching, the yearning. The woman who said every morning at 10 o'clock, I called my mother and every morning at 10 o'clock, I start for the phone, searching and yearning. And then you move on to on from that into recognizing a new normal, getting more reorganized, that you go into disorganization and despair, disorganization and despair, which is some of what you had missed you, uh, around the grief issues with your grandmother. You know? Despair about your kids, about what they were doing. And, and so you, and you're disorganized. This is a time in life, in grief, when we are the most vulnerable and we're asked to do the most difficult things, to get the papers in order to get everything done. Yeah, that's the hardest thing. I, with my parents that I had to deal with, it was so hard to get everything together. We're just now two years later, finishing up everything with my dad. Yeah. It's crazy. And then you get into, finally you come back to reorganization and recovery. And then Bill Warden later after that, another psychologist had a, a really good tasks of mourning. And he went right back. Every every single one of them in this evolution of grief have stayed with recognizing the reality of the loss. And that is hard. Every widow at some point says, 
oh, I've got to tell him this. And he's not there to tell. Recognizing the reality of the loss. And we, we're talking about death, but we have losses, so many losses in life. Loss of job, loss, you know, loss of a home, loss of, there's losses every day. There are big losses and little losses. And they're all grief, right? And they're all griefs. And so Bill Warden said, recognizing the reality of the loss. And then he ends with developing a new and endearing and enduring relationship with the deceased. And the big one that Warden has that I like is getting accustomed to an environment without the deceased. You know, uh, particularly any time with widowhood or whatever, you, you know, women sleep with the lights on, with music on all night. You're getting used to a new environment. And then Shara Isle is the one I think who came out with the magic words we still use, new normal. Yep, that's what I was thinking when you were describing it was new normal. I didn't yeah. know who started it. Cherokee was the groundbreaker back again in the, the 70s and 80s uh, with a little book called Empty Arms, which recognized the importance of infant death. And before that, we just, we had what was called the rugby pass of the delivery room. If a baby was stillborn, the image was the doctor tossed the baby to the nurse who took it away. Joy, you also had started to mention before we started the show that Kubler Ross's journey and her path wasn't even a smooth journey, that there was a block or she ended up going backwards or something too. When did that happen? She packed auditoriums. She was the queen and she was great. And she evolved right along with it, kind of like you two have done. And she established a really nice retreat center outside of San Diego. And she went into the study of life after death communication. And she was scammed by a preacher with a church with one of the strange names. And he convinced her that he could channel dead people. Oh. And he was a total fake. Wow. And Deanna Edwards, who was a great singer and who worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was bringing music into her work at that time. And Deanna really exposed him. And it just pretty much ruined the world because it was a big scandal within the bereavement community. Yeah. It pretty much said, well, she did great at first and then she went bananas. So the study of life after death communication was pretty much put on hold after that. It's picked up more now. Of course, Edward Casey has the one who's still, his institute is still there. But I think everybody who works with grief is going to have some opinion of what happens afterward because of, of what we've heard, what we've seen right. from people who are dying. Yeah. So in the 70s, you were seeing people start to, even though there were these, it sounds like these discomforts with discussing yeah. spirituality and afterlife, they were still starting to recognize grief itself and talk about grief. Oh, yeah. Grief, grief became a kind of a big thing. And then we also, we learned a very important thing, which was um, Teresa Rando broke away with that and psychologist and she wrote a book called Treatment of Complicated Mourning. And we recognized complicated mourning. And my mother is a perfect example of this. Even though she had communication, my mother experienced the death of a three-year-old daughter. And Rowena, who died 19 years before I was born, died of pneumonia. And uh, as she was dying, she looked opened her eyes, looked up and said to my mother and her mother, oh, mommy, look at all the babies. See all the babies. Wow. She looked up and reached her little arms up. And mother didn't know what to make of that. And later a minister told her, well, she was seeing the angels coming for her. Now, that should, shoulda, woulda, coulda, didn't, you know, that... Um, make a big difference to my mother and be comforting. But mother mourned Rowena and did not know what, we, nobody knew what to do then. She had horrible migraine headaches. She was sick so much of the time. Uh, she was irritable, which is a wonderful word, explains everything. <laughs> and it was not until 
I was into the bereavement thing and we were at a, a, a workshop we were doing in my hometown for a funeral director and she was there. And I talked about grief and she said, but how do you get over it? And that was the first time she'd said anything and all at once Kazinga, I tied it in with all of her stuff that was going on. And so I said, what is a really good thing to do is to sit down and write a letter to the person who died and then write a letter from that person back to you. And she said, well, I'll try. And she did. And it was later, she called me about two weeks later and I hadn't heard from her. She called and said, I just want to thank the good Lord and you. Well, it's second billing, but it's not bad company. <laughs> <laughs> she had written the letters and she said, I feel so much better. Well, she lost weight. She fell in love. My father had died years and years and years before. And she had a really good life after that. When she died, and this is what consistently, because we, we'd been saying write letters for a long time, the letters are almost always very simple. They aren't, you know, I would write 10 pages in a small font, write all, you know, all write justified. You know, I, I yeah. would go on and <laughs> these were all very simple. And mother, I looked for mother's letters and I found them and they were in bright yellow stationery tied together. I mean, not faded with time, they were bright yellow. And the first letter said, dear Rowena, I'm gonna let you go. I know you're with your daddy. I know you're all right. I love you, mommy. And Rowena had written back and all she said was, mommy, I don't want you to cry no more, Rowena. Oh. Man, I would have been at that computer for hours. Yeah. And then her partner, she would never live with him. That was a no. But at eight o'clock in the morning, Jack would come four blocks down the street and have breakfast with her. Then they would go out to lunch. Then they'd watch soap operas. She'd fix dinner. They'd stay awake through the 10 o'clock news. And he'd drive four blocks back. Home. <laughs> <laughs> and when Jack died, I found a letter to Jack. Oh, you know, with uh, after mother died with, with the Rowena yeah. letter. And yeah. all that had taken was, she said, Jack, I know you're with the Lord. I know you're all right, Mary. And then she had put a PS and her eyes were failing at this time. And so the writing was going uphill. She had written PS, you are my love. Mm -hmm. And Jack Aww. needed to write back. Yeah. Aww. So. We have, have recognized complicated mourning, different types of right. mourning. Right. We do, we do not have a good language with grief. Yeah. We do not have a word that fits grief and relief when there's been long suffering. Now, what decades are you talking about these stories that you're saying fall into with like you're talking about this evolution of how we as people treat grief? With my mother, it would have been the 80s, been the 90s. Okay. So fairly recently. Yeah. 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 I did the letter too to my mom. I had to do that for me to let her go. I did actually write a letter to her. I didn't have her write back, but I did write a letter to her and it helped. I love that my therapist told me to, to do that, to help me. Yeah. It gets it's down into a concrete word there. Yeah. Trisha, you should sit down and have your mom write you a letter back. Yeah. I know I need to do that. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. And what you're nailing, and I think it's beautiful work that you've done, Joy, is the hardest thing that is hard for me to talk about, but it's the loss of a child. Yeah. And particularly with complicated mourning that comes in often. One thing we've learned, I learned it with working with parents of murdered children, the really great leader here of parents who had a program for parents of murdered children insisted on saying that this was the worst grief. And from that, we learned grief is not a competitive sport. Right. The worst grief is your grief. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, a murdered child is, well, what, a, what about the van with, with a family where all four children die? Right, right. You know, so you can't compare that. And so we have a very poor language still. And nobody's working on developing the language of grief either. 
Well, and I love, I mean, we're trying to help open communication so that it takes away stigmas. And I think something you've always taught me too was if you feel they're writing you back and that's what they have to say, don't question whether it's really them or not. That doesn't matter. Does it make you feel better? Is it helping you? And just accept and embrace that. Oh, yeah, because they're always part of you. They are all people who die are always part of you. It's been a bad relationship. It's really important to create an enduring relationship with them that involves some forgiveness because a lot of people die not being loved, you know, being real bastards, if you'll, you know. And so that involves that too. But yeah, a, ch- a child's death is a really, really tough thing. And it's very common. Yeah, I recently had a friend who just lost her son and it's just, it's heart-wrenching to think about every day. I don't know how she's getting through it. Yeah, and, and of children of all ages, because we live in a beautiful retirement community and it's an independent living. It's not an assisted living or a nursing home. It's just independent apartments where we have all these perks like a restaurant and heated garage, all the great things that we, you know, and they're really good. There are 153 apartments here. Well, we're all over 55, but most of us are in our 70s and 80s. So our children are dying and they're dying and they're in your age, 60s. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm younger than that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're 70, you have a chance of dying. You know, we have several 90 year olds here who have 72, 73 year old oh, children. Wow. Right. Right. So yeah, that's, that is a real a real factor. And I seem to remember, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, as a kid in the seventies, I did attend a few funerals and I do remember very little talk, you know, as adults to me, as the child going, my granddaddy was one who I think did the best job because he felt that my first experience with death should be someone I didn't know. So it wouldn't affect me emotionally. And it was his brother and he held me. I I must've been I don't know, three, he he could hold me and he, you know, and he held me at the visitation at the foot of the casket. And he said, that's my brother. And he told me all these great things about his brother. And he said, now, you know, he's with God now. And if you look at him long enough, you can see him smile. And he goes, do you see him smile? And I was convinced (laughs) (laughs) I, I can see him smile. And From there on, I always felt I had to go to a visitation and see someone for my closure. And I think it came from his introduction for me to death and making it positive and telling me he's not in that body anymore. He's good. He's in heaven. You could see him smile if you stare at him long enough, you know, and and that was a real beautiful, you know, nice thing. And, but I remember him going up against the rest of the family to even do that. The family was so mad at him yes. for taking me and talking to me. So, and that was what you're saying, like in the seventies where it looked like it was, you know, there were some people, try, there was almost this little war going on and people wanting to make this more talked about while others were still trying to suppress it. Children. Yeah. And protect- yeah. My family was like that too. They wouldn't say anything. They were raised in that time. Yeah. where they wouldn't talk about it. They would just go to the funeral or go to the service afterwards and just mingle. They wouldn't cry in front of anybody. And so they had all of that going on with me. So that's why when I lost like a friend or my parents, I was blank faced. I didn't do anything until I actually went to a therapist. Oh, and you're, you're such a good example, Trish. It's such a good example because we have moved over the deck and it has taken decades into now we recognize communal grief you know there was a beautiful memorial for covid victims before the president's inauguration and we did that nationally and national every every september 11th there will be a commemoration nationally so we've done more community grief all of the flowers that appear where there where there has been a mass shooting or been multiple deaths. So, so we're learning to mourn as a community and as a group. What do you think has been some of the biggest milestones and steps of an improvement that you've seen since you started all this with grief? Well, I, I mentioned earlier, recognition of, of infant death and the importance of that, uh, the importance of miscarriage and learning more. One of the big changes is learning 
what to say and not to say. I swore that if one more person after Marv died, if one more person said, I'm sorry for your loss, I'd hit him. <laughs> right. Dragnet started it. You know, remember the old television show Dragnet, ma'am, I'm sorry for your loss. You know, but they don't have to mention the name. They don't have to know who it is. One of the funniest things, this is not some of the big change. Well, yeah, that is because now we have more humor around grief. Like you were saying, Tricia, we didn't used to have any humor around grief. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we didn't talk about it. Now we have, there is a great, a great sitcom from Britain called The IT Crowd. And the IT Crowd has three people who are the IT people. You should watch this, Misty. These are your people. Guys, <laughs> paper. And these three people are their IT departments, very British. And one of the guys has, has glasses, bow tie, and an afro, and he's white. Uh, Roy is just a big slob. And no matter what he wears, he looks terrible. And their boss is, is a, a gal with high heels, a, a tight skirt, and knows nothing about technology. They have a, a tape recorder on the side of Roy's desk. And when the phone rings, the tape recorder starts, and you hear, hello tech squad, what's your problem? And then you pause, pause, pause. And then the recording says, all right, have you tried turning it off and on again? If that doesn't work, call us back. Thank you. He ne they never answer the phone. <laughs> but one of, their, one of their friend's fathers died. And so they, they went to the, the funeral and they were standing and there was a line, you know, the receiving line. And Roy said, I don't know what to say. And Jen, their boss said, just go up, take her hand and say, I'm sorry for your loss, move on. And he said, all right. So he went up and he took her hand and he said, I'm sorry for your loss and move on. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> so we've learned, we've learned that, that we cannot take everything so seriously. So that has been a change. A, a change is recognizing infant death, recognizing that there is humor in it. Darcy Sims had the best quote ever. She said, the truly bereaved are those who never love. Oh, yeah. If they love, will grieve. Recognizing that, that love is going to cost grief. Another thing is recognizing that we all grieve. The question yes. is how we grieve. And, right. and you were a good example, Trisha, of saying, you know, yeah, I, I knew a therapist would help. Yeah. How we grieve, we choose how we grieve. People can go into addictions really easily with grief yes. by not recognizing it. I, my quote is, whoever dies is worth a million tears. And a exactly. really good example is, children. of course, big, big change. Now there are over 200 centers for grieving children. We used to do exactly what you have, protect the children, don't let them near it, don't, you know, don't let them know about it. And now there are over 200 centers for grieving children, a national group. And it's, it's terrific. And a good example of that for all of us really is of a facilitator at Teddy Bear Hollow uh, who had a little four-year-old and his baby brother had died. And he was in his little group of littlies, we call them. And he said, my mommy cries all the time and I can't help her. And the facilitator said, oh, what do you do when she cries? And he said, I climb up on her lap and I put my arms around her and I pat her and I say, don't cry, mommy, don't cry, mommy. And the facilitator said, I'm so glad you told us that. The next time your mommy cries, you climb up on her lap, you put her, your arms around her, you pat her back and you say, go ahead and cry, mommy. It will make you feel better. That takes all the burden off of him. I just got chills on that one. Once parents grieve clean, the kids will. Yeah. But children will hold their grief in until their parents are okay. You know, it's funny. You talk about the sense of humor. It is great when people can have a sense of humor. And my grandfather died when I was in high school in the late 80s. And my aunt and I wanted to put a, a pack of gum in his pocket because he was always known yeah. at church as the man with the <laughs> bubble gum or the, he's always <laughs> offering people chewing gum. And I remember when we did it, we knew it would make us feel better because we said, he's missing this. And we were a little worried what other people would think. 
because this was the 80s yeah. and there was still, you know, different opinions. And we would listen to people as they went by the casket. And we were so pleased to hear people say, oh, look, he's oh, got, got he's got gum. some gum. <laughs> he's always had gum oh, and it and it yeah. cheered people up. So I think this is a good point that you mentioned. It that is so cool because that is one of the big changes that we we've really but we have celebrations of life now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very different funerals. And different burials, many more natural burials, many more cremations. But yeah, things like dressing, you know, dressing like, you know, so the teenagers are in their jeans and it's really good. Uh, one of the humorous things, if we move, as we move on to communications and whatever is in that very thin dimension around us, uh, that when, as Marv was, was dying, we had a reclining couch and he couldn't lay down when he was sleeping and so he slept on the reclining couch and I slept with my head on his lap and a quilt over me and then I would wake up at at uh, one o'clock and give him liquid pain killer that was you know an opioid really a strong one and one night I woke up and I gave him his medication and he drifted off back to sleep and I reached down because my quilt had slipped on the floor. And as I reached down, the room changed shape and it became oblong. And that was filled with, and I knew it was 15. I didn't count them, 15 figures in white. And one was looking at Marv like this. <laughs> and then they just, it was a nanosecond, it, it, quicker than his finger snap. And they weren't angelic figures. They were just figures in white. And the next day I thought they were his guides. And so I told, I thought I should tell him this. And so I told him, and then he said, man, if I need 15 guides, I'm in deep bleep. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a dream. It was a vision. Yep. And those are very common. I think near, with people, yeah. a lot of what you two are into with near-death experiences, communication, that's the cutting edge now. And, and California has some of the best groups, I bet. How have these experiences shaped your belief in life after death? I always kind of, I always had that growing up back in, because I grew up back in the, in the 40s. We were of the belief that heaven was, the streets were made of gold, you know, the pearly gates, but... And then I learned, oh, those are, were from the poor people. So they thought heaven must be really good, you know, so they, because they were poor. Well, it was a peaceful place because people were so tired. So they were making heaven exactly like they thought they wanted after they died. So that was the early way. Heaven was up there. Hell was down here because the earth was flat, was the early belief. And then as I read more, became acquainted more, got into death and dying, then it became, it's just a, a different dimension. They're very close to us. So I'm, I'm all for the letter writing, talking to, they're around. I don't think they're hanging around someplace, but I think they're, we could say on call that we can contact them when we need to. Oh, cool. Yes, exactly. There are so many different theories that the soul is divisible, that there are many parts of the soul and can be divided, that um, another vision which is different than a dream that I had. I was sitting on the couch and I had my glass of wine and I was crying and Marv had been dead for about a month. And I, um, I looked up and in a corner, I saw him in a wheel of, of blue, just his head. I could see his face. And I was, my face was in a, a wheel of, of kind of rosy pink. And I knew we were gonna combine. And that again was just a nanosecond, wow. just a, not even a full second, but it was an extremely, good vision and I have heard him his voice a couple of times so and that's not unusual or not, not unnatural I don't think yeah a lot of people have those experiences do you have any other ones you can tell us about well I have my angelic one I mentioned yeah let's hear about that one of the hospitals here offered a weekend on healing touch which is like Reiki it's an energy healing if we're working with energy we're going to believe that energy continues on Right. So uh, we were working with energy. Our instructor was Professor Emeritus from the University of Iowa Hospitals, which is a big place in the big Midwest. Millie Friel. Millie was just a stitch. She was really good. 
And we had been in one room with our massage tables, you know, doing healing touch. And she uh, could not get her CD player to play because there was so much energy. So she put it out in the hall. Oh, that's fine. That was fine. I was with a really cute physical therapist. His name was Joe, and we were doing <laughs> chakra spread. This was developed for hospice patients. And hospice is a great thing. It has been a, one of the, the super good things that have come to America. And we were doing a chakra spread down all of the chakras. It's like a dance. You know, you bring your arms up like this, and you spread the chakra, and you bring your arms up again. You spread the chakras three times over each chakra. And I went down Joe's chakra, which would be the crown, you know, the forehead and the throat. And I got to the heart chakra. And as my arms went up behind me was an eight foot tall angel. I was not into angels. This oh. was when you, you are too young to remember them, but there were little <laughs> lapel pins and collar pins with little tiny angels and people were wearing them. I thought they were cutesy. I didn't like them. I was <laughs> not into angels. And my arms were up and there it was. And I started to turn around and I thought, you're not going to see that. And I looked at it through the back of my head. You know, we say mothers have eyes in the back of their I yeah. really had eyes in the back of my head and I was looking at it from there. Wow. And it didn't look like any picture I saw. And I th always thought if I saw an angel, it'd be a compilation of pictures I'd seen. Right. This mm -hmm. one wasn't. Its arms and face were light. Mm -hmm. And it had a white breastplate all the way to the floor. And what was amazing were its wings. They were in giant folds. And they went above the floor like a bridal train. And as wow. we moved back, they floated just above the floor. And it stayed with me. And I knew that once it, I was through, it would be gone. So I said, I really want to see you again. And when I finished, it disappeared. Wow. And so I, I thought, am I going to tell this? Or am I going to just leave? Right. You know, not <laughs> look like a total idiot. <laughs> and really, and our instructor. And she said, oh. When you get to that energy level again, you'll see it. It's always there. Well, for years I went, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> nothing, never saw it again. <laughs> You're like, I went I... book after book looking at pictures, four pictures of, of nothing, absolutely nothing. But I'd like to point out as you were talking about it, you know, cue those chimes again. Those they chimes went on, they're here. Yeah. <laughs> I did. They're with you. The angel is with you. I never thought of that, but. Yeah, Joy did Reiki on me when I was going through my chemo. Yeah, I love Reiki. I mean, I studied that a little bit too, so I love it. Forgot about that. There's so much energy we don't understand, so we're we're learning more. Right, we're learning more. Yeah. That is really neat. We are energy, and Joy, it's interesting you mentioned being part of, like we're talking about with Marv, when I've read about that, and some people might be like me, where when you first hear it, it's, it's very uncomfortable to think that your soul can be divided or rejoined with another soul, or that can kind yeah. of spook people, or it's too weird. But when I heard the comparison to like cookie dough, for example, you could pull a piece of cookie dough off and make a separate cookie, yeah. or you could put it back in the cookie dough and roll it back in. Then it made sense to me. Yeah, not a hard concept. Yeah. I've also heard someone describe it as, you know, a wave that comes in from the ocean and then rejoins the ocean is still a wave that's part of the ocean. And so those visuals kind of helped me understand that, okay, there is definitely more to our energy in our life than we understand. And I, I have to just be okay with that. I don't have to understand it. Just trust that it's all going to make sense one day. It's all going to make sense. Yeah. And it's, it's all a part of wholeness. Wow. And that's just really cool. It's an incredible story. I love that angel story. I do too. I'm so glad it's mine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so now we're going to go into talking about some of your novels that you have done for a second called Boob Girls. How did you come up with that name? It was just there. You know, there's, there's energy out there that if we don't overthink, if we don't analyze, if we let creativity happen, it does. It was, the title was just there, The Burned Out Old Broads at Table 12. <laughs> 
the Booker. And I spoke at a Presbyterian church in a little town. It was the whole act of the town. I mean, if, if anything went on, it went on with the Presbyterians at, at uh, was either North Bend or South Bend, Nebraska. And I was their Harvest Home speaker. And they had two big banners, one on each side of fe their fellowship hall where the dinner was. And all the banners said were, boob girls, <laughs> Friday at six. And I said, we are going to have more men at this event yeah. than ever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the burned out old broads at Table 12. And they also, and they are four widows. So we talk some about grief. And, yeah, and they start out in a, in a cemetery. You don't get better than that. You have a sense of humor in it. You have everything. How many mysteries? There are 12 of them now. And I'm, I, I have finished them. I wanted to live long enough to write 12 books in honor of the burned out old broads at Table 12. Oh, got it. They sit in their retirement community. They're at Table 12. We'll put a link to those books too. Oh, they are. And what The one was made into a musical, which will be redone oh. in another year or so. And it was a five night, five matinee sellout with standing ovations. Wow. I would have loved to see that. They're endorsed by Phyllis Diller. Oh, I know her. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. That's amazing. Fun to write. One is a takeoff on nursery rhymes. One is called 10 Little Puritans, a takeoff on Agatha Christie's then there were none. From the Eye of the Moose is from the old-fashioned scary movies people my age used to go to. And also, it, they have really been fun and they've been surprisingly successful. I was really pleased with them. Amazing. Yeah. So the Boop Girls, four widows who click together. And since we're talking about life after death and all this stuff, there is a character in one of the books, the second book, which is called uh, The Boob Girls in Lies, Spies, and Cinnamon Rolls. And the maker of the cinnamon rolls is Evangeline Goldberg. And Evangeline is huge. We hear her before we see her. And she wears an apron with the day of the week on it, but it's always the wrong day of the week. And she uses pin curls to make bobby you know, bobby pins and pin curls. And then she pulls the pin curls out. So she always has this electric appearance and her only footwear is crocheted slippers with pom-poms but she gives us the theology of the series the four great religious truths and the four great religious truths are palestinians do not recognize jewish rights to the holy land jews do not recognize jesus as their messiah protestants do not recognize the pope as their religious leader and Baptists do not recognize each other at Hooters. <laughs> so there, that is the quality of the book, right? But all of the right there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. That sums up the sense of humor right there. Yeah, right there. That's yeah. Yeah, I've read part of it. I have to get more of the books. I love reading part of that book already. So I'm gonna get more. Can't wait to finish them. They are good. Yeah, they're good to write, and they were fun. And and I, I get fan letters. I'm just amazed. More than just my fan letter? More than you. And people buy them for, for ladies who are ill. Oh, nice. Because we need to laugh. Yes. And they are, they are laugh out loud. We say, if you do not laugh out loud, you get your money back. Oh, wow. We haven't made any refunds. That's incredible. That's a good, yes. Congratulations. <laughs> no refunds awesome. yet, I bet. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. I don't think you'll have to worry about that. That's great. You had mentioned that you do some in-person presentations sometimes. Do you have any coming up um, now that the world has been opening back up? Well, I was at, at uh, a really neat little library in Silver City, Iowa. And one of talking about good, good ideas that would not have flown 30 years ago. Uh, one of them mentioned a book she had read about a set called The Cemetery. And it was about all the people who were dead in the cemetery talking to each other. And they discovered a bunch of affairs they didn't know about. And they gossiped and they talked oh. about whose children were coming to visit and why they didn't. You know, and it was a, a, it just sounded like an absolutely delightful. I wish I had thought of an idea. Oh, that is, <laughs> that is neat. But a lot of libraries. I don't have many coming up. People, you know, in my age group, I, I talk to old ladies. And Ted and I say, our goal in life is to make old ladies laugh. Oh, that's and great. Right now, yeah. we're, they're still being careful. So I haven't gotten a lot 
you know, booked up, but they're beginning to pick up and I love, I feel, I'm so grateful I'm still able to do this. I'm 83, my gosh, I didn't think I'd live this long. You're as sharp as a tech, you're amazing. Yeah, you don't look that old at all either. I like her best and as yeah. <laughs> There you go. Well, no, this has been wonderful. I think we covered a lot of interesting and great ground. And it's been wonderful to hear your viewpoint of grief through time. So Joy, if someone wanted to get hold of you or reach out to you, what is the best way we can, is, would it be the centering.org site? We can include it in our notes. Centering.corp.org would be good or theboobgirls.com joy.johnson at msn.com. That's my writer's name. So joy.johnson at msn.com. You've got that. Thank you so much for all your stories. Oh my gosh, this has been so fun. So thank you. I love it. I will keep in touch with you. We'll be in touch. Till next time. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at trisha.misty.tm at gmail.com. You can also go to our website, survivingdeathanddying.com, for links to the books we talk about. So please like, share, subscribe, and follow. Well, we did it again. We survived death and dying. Another episode. Because we believe life and love never dies.